Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. This is Tim Worth from Morial TV and Morial Radio. I'm here live with James Jacob Prash in England. Uh, Jacob, we're going into the Easter season now, and uh, there's a lot of disagreement between believers, meaning well, uh, whether we should call it Easter, which some would say a pagan holiday, or Resurrection Sunday. What are your thoughts on that? Easter definitely comes from the pagan goddess Ashtart. Ashtart or Ashtaroth. Ashtart, definitely Ashtart. But so does Esther come from Ashtart. Today is Purim. It's the Jewish feast of, of Hagpurim. Most years, Passover and Easter go together. This year, Easter and Purim go together the way the Jewish lunar and the solar calendars coincide. The question is, what do the scriptures teach? All of these things, like egg hunts and things like this and the Easter bunny, these are of pagan origin. There's no question about it. What happened was in the 14th century, at something known as the Quadridecimian Schism, replacement theology was growing in the post-Nicene church rapidly. And at the Council of Nicaea, this began to take firm, firm root. One of the things that happened was they moved the day of the resurrection to the first Sunday after the spring equinox, the first Sunday after the vernal equinox, which had been a pagan Greco-Roman holiday. Jewish believers, that is Jewish bishops or pastors, were underrepresented at the council when this was decided. The question is, what do the scriptures tell us? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians all make it very clear. Jesus was not crucified on Good Friday. Neither was he resurrected on Easter Sunday. Jesus was crucified at of Hag of Hag uh, of Pesach, and he rose on Yom Rishon of Hag, Hag Matzot, the feast of first fruits, the Jewish feast of first fruits, the Sunday, the first day of the week by the Jewish calendar, Sunday, not Monday's the first day, of Hag Matzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, first of all, which is the most paschal of the epistles. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. Look with me, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Notice believers, again, as we always point out, don't die, they sleep. Unsaved people, non-believers die. God's people sleep. You go to sleep, you wake up again. And when you sleep, you're conscious in another realm. So when we enter eternity, we're in the conscious presence of the Lord in the realm of eternity. The body is asleep. We're unconscious of what's going on in this life or this world, at least our body is, but we are still in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And then you wake up again at the resurrection. The first fruits. On that Sunday of Passover week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Hag Matzot, the high priest would go into the Kidron Valley when it was still dark on the east side of the Temple Mount between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. He would wait for the first pin of light, when it was still dark, to show up on back of the Mount of Olives, Harazayatim. And once he saw the first pin of light coming up in the east, he would ceremonially harvest the first stalk of grain, of the spring grain coming out of the earth, and call it the first fruit. All four Gospels tell us the very hour of the very day when the high priest was bringing the first fruit into the temple, Yeshua, Jesus, was raising from the dead the first fruit of the resurrection. That was Yom Rishon of Hagmatzot, <clears throat> the Hebrew feast of first fruits, 
from the book of Leviticus, chapter 23 and 24. It had nothing whatsoever to do with Easter. But then we get the accompanying question that I've answered many times. Did Jesus die on a Friday, or where do you get the three days and three nights if he died on a Friday? That's the question. Some people have said he died on a Thursday, others that he was crucified on a Wednesday. You need the three days and three nights. Somehow it has something to do with, the, obviously, the two witnesses in Revelation 11 replay it. It relates to the resurrection of Lazarus. By the fourth day, somebody in Jewish belief was, was no longer being hovered over by the Ruach HaKodesh, by the Holy Spirit. Their corpse was dead, but the Shekinah had departed by the fourth day. So therefore, Jesus had a raise on the third day instead of the fourth, because the Jews believed at the fourth day you're finished. Spiritually, there was no life in your corpse anymore of any kind. The Holy Spirit had completely departed from the presence of the corpse and somebody dead four days. This is important in understanding the resurrection of Lazarus. Well, let's understand this further. Thou will not suffer thy holy one to see decay. He couldn't reach that fourth day. He had to raise up before that fourth day. So where do you get the three days and three nights? For all ritual and religious purposes, Jews tabulate time on the basis of the creation narrative in Genesis. Or lehoshek, light to dark. It doesn't matter how many hours of light there are. Once the sun goes down, that's a day. In the normal cycle of a year, there's more hours of daylight certain times of the year, like in the summer, and fewer hours of daylight in the winter. Once it gets dark, that's a day. Or a hoshek, based on the creation narrative in Genesis. Now let's understand this even Further, there's actually halakha and rabbinic law, and rabbinic law, Talmudic Judaism, is a false Judaism. But what do you do if you're a Jewish scientist working at the North Pole <laughs> and it's six months of no light? They actually have, when you light the Shabbos candles, they actually have halakha, rabbinic instruction for those things. Absurd. <coughs> it's always based on light to dark. Once the sun goes down, that's it. Time is based on that. Now, we have two words for time in Greek in the New Testament. Kronos and Kairos. Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is where we get the word chronology, like the book of Chronicles. It's the order of events. Kairos is a clock. It's based on planetary motion. All time is based on planetary motion. Actually, there is a clock, an atomic clock, that works by particle emission, but even that clock has to be calibrated in terms of nanoseconds, in terms of planetary motion. So all kairos, all time, depends on planetary motion. Eternity is not a clock that keeps going. Eternity is the absence of any clock at all. In eternity, there is no kairos. There is only chronos. If you look at the book of Revelation, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And then I saw, writes John. John sees past events happening in the present. He sees future events happening in the present. He refers to future events as current and past event as current. Past, present, and future are all the same, yet there is a chronos. There is an order of events. How can we relate to this and how we can un understand it? Remember, unsaved people die. Believers go to sleep when they give up the ghost. When you go to sleep, neurophysiologists tell us we dream. You can dream of people who you knew who died and are alive again in the dream. You can see future events have yet to happen taking place, as it were, currently, 
within the context of the dream, you can see past events happening again. Past, present, and future are all the same in a dream, yet there's a chronology. When we enter eternity, we go to sleep. Our consciousness is in a different sphere. We're in the presence of Jesus, where past, present, and future are all the same. To understand what it's like to give up the ghost, understand what it's like to go to sleep. Your consciousness enters a different sphere where there is no time, but there is an order of events taking place outside of time. That teaches about eternity. Now let's go back to the creation. Or la hoshek, light to dark. Doesn't matter how many hours of daylight there are, only matters that the sun goes down and gets dark. It's all depending on planetary motion. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he was caught up to the third heaven, the third heaven, as the Greeks understood these things and the Romans. The first heaven is the atmosphere of the earth. The third heaven is eternity. The second heaven is outer space. Outer space, where the celestial bodies are, planets, stars, moon, sun. That's the second heaven. In Revelation, you see something borrowed from the Old Testament where the heavens, shamayim in Hebrew, shamayim, oren is in Greek, but shamayim, in Hebrew it's a plural word, there's no heaven, there's only heavens, are rolled up like the scroll. What happens at the end of the ages, the second heaven disappears. Eternity meets time and space on the earth because the second heaven disappears. Outer space disappears, it becomes rolled up like a scroll. So eternity meets time and space on the earth. The second heaven is gone and time, that is Kairos, comes from the second heaven. So, so that's what happens. Thy kingdom come, eternity comes. Well, let's understand this further. At certain times, however, in scripture, at certain times, God intervened with Kairos. He intervened with planetary or celestial motion. One time, of course, is in the book of Joshua, where he made a day last, not 24 hours, but 48 hours. <laughs> okay, he made the day last 48 hours. The sun stood still. In the book of Revelation, we read that a day will go from 24 hours to 16. A third of the day and a third of the night will disappear. What is now 24 hours will go to 16 hours. That's something. Okay. Now let's look at another time when God intervenes with time. King Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the strength of Yahweh. The Lord adds 15 years to his life when he's terminally ill, and the sun goes back. The average lifespan at that time was in the mid-30s. People, uh, sorry, the average lifespan at that time was about 50, 50, sorry. But King Hezekiah was in his mid-30s. He becomes terminally ill in his mid-30s. God gives him another 15 years and makes the sun go back. God intervenes with time. To reset the clock and get it right again, Something has to happen because one king of the Jews had his life extended by making time go back. Another king of the Jews had to balance it out by having his life curtailed and making the sun go forward. You understand? So let's look at Amos chapter 8. Verse 9, it'll come about on that day, declares the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Now that has a meaning for the end of the age, but it was a prophecy of what happened when the Lord Jesus took our sin and died on the cross. The sun would go down at noon. Then it would go back up again. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke. 
Luke's nativity narrative when Jesus is crucified. We read about this, and in this particular story, we have the story of the two, we call them the good thief, the, the two of them, okay? But when he's on the cross, inexplicably, it becomes very dark. That was a fulfillment of the prophecy of Amos chapter 8. He was on the cross from 12 to 3 from the sixth hour to the ninth hour since sunrise. From 12 to 3, it gets dark, okay? That fulfills the prophecy of Amos 8, I'll make the sun go down at noon. Verse 44 of Luke chapter 23, it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. <clears throat> Meaning that Sinful man was no longer separated from holy God. In any event, let's look at this. This is the 14th of Nisan. Wrong phase of the lunar and solar cycle for it to be an eclipse. It could not have been a lunar eclipse. It could not have been a solar eclipse. God intervened with time, just as he did in Joshua, just as he did with Hezekiah, and just as he's going to do in the book of Revelation. He intervenes with time by intervening with the normal orbits and functions and patterns of the celestial bodies, especially the sun. Okay. So, if Jesus is crucified on a Friday, he's on the cross at 12, the sun goes down, that's a day. When he's off the cross, the sun goes back up. That's two days. Friday night, the sun goes down again. Now you got two days and two nights. Saturday, sun comes up, it's a day. Saturday night, sun goes down. Wakes up Sunday morning, you've got your three days and three nights as a Jew would count time. It's always based on the creation narrative or Lahoshek. There was two sunsets on that Friday. There is no problem saying that Jesus died on a Friday and rose Sunday. You'd still have three days and three nights in fulfillment of the prophecy of Amos 8. Understanding the relationship between the longevity of Hezekiah, the king of the Jews, being increased because the longevity of Jesus, king of the Jews, was decreased. God intervened with time in both cases. With Hezekiah, he made the time go back. With Jesus, he made the time go forward. He made the sun go down until Jesus came off the cross. Then the sun goes up again. Hence, on Friday, you had two days because you had two sundowns. Then you had Saturday, and then you had um, Sunday morning when he rose from the dead after Saturday night. You've got your three days and three nights. But this was not Easter Sunday. It was Yom Rishon of Hag Matzot, the Hebrew feast of first fruits. And it was not Good Friday. It was Erev Hag. But there's no problem saying he died on a Friday and he rose on a Sunday. But it was not Easter. The church changed this. Now look, we're told in Colossians 2, 16 to 19, not to quabble about days. One holds one day, one another. We're told in Romans 14, not to judge another person for what days they observe. But we need to understand historically and theologically that Jesus did not die on Good Friday, and he did not raise from the dead on Easter Sunday. That came about because of replacement theology, because of an infringing Greco-Roman paganization of the church and because of an incipient anti-Semitism in the patristic era of the church fathers. Uh, it's not what happened. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians and Amos all tell us the truth of what actually happened. That's the explanation of it. Now, my family being Jews, we always observed Passover. It was the one time of year where we take the Lord's Supper together at home as a family as Jesus did at the Paschal Seder we call the Last Supper. 
Uh, it was never an issue for my family because they're Israeli Jews. It was never an issue for us. But for Christians, I understand it is an issue. If you want to celebrate Easter Sunday, do it with my blessings. I have no particular problem. But understand, theologically and historically, that's not when it happened. It happened to fulfill the Feast of First Fruits, Paul tells us. And it happened to fulfill the prophecies of Amos chapter 8, Luke tells us. That's essentially the explanation. I hope it's clear to people. We have it on other tapes, and I go through it at a much slower pace. It's a bit much to take in if it's new to you, but that's the nutshell version. Okay, thank you, James Jacob Pratt.